and welcome to Fixing South Sudan, your ideas for building the new nation. I am Adingor. Fixing South Sudan. Our special panel looks at the liberation agenda on the occasion of the 37th anniversary of the founding of the Sudan People's Liberation Movement Army. Why did the movement take up arms against the North more than 21 years ago? What was the strategic vision of the movement for a liberated nation. And joining us in our panel are General Pyang Deng Kual, former IGP, South Sudan Police Service. Honorable Susan Wasuk Sokiri, Member of Parliament, TNLA. General Marshal Stephen Babanen, Commander, Northern Area Command, SSPDF. And Honorable Dr. Maj Martin, my dear guy. Welcome to all of you. And it's a pleasure to welcome you to this program to speak about history and a history that has shaped the trajectory of our future. And General Piang, I will begin with you because you have been part of this uh, long war that was fought from 1983 to 2005. And when we talk about the SPLA, SPLM. First, it is studied as individual journeys, and later on, it became a collective effort. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Comrade Mading. And I start with, uh, first of all, to remembering our fellow heroes who start uh, dying since 1983 up to the last uh, fighting in 2005. And I want to congratulate also all our gallant forces of former SPLA, which have been turned now to South Sudan Defense Force. And also I want to congratulate all the Sudanese and South Sudanese uh, people who really sacrifice in those struggles. Because I said Sudanese because there were Sudanese who were part to this revolution, to this movement, and we have also to thank them and congratulate them for this day. This is the third, th 37th years since the start of revolution of the SPLM, SPLA. So I congratulate all and I really thank you for this program. Thank you very much. And we are in Bell Farm, and the road began uh, as a walk towards the Bell Farm, the actual Bell Farm. And General Piang, what can you say about why you personally took to the bush to be part of that liberation? Uh, for sure, is uh, I have to correct some uh, statement. It was uh, really it started from individual conditions or situation. Like me, definitely there was a problem in my area, home area, BA. But definitely when we came and formed the movement called SPLM, SPLA, we started now to say that we fight the government and not the North. It's the government that was seated in Khartoum. 
and definitely because of all what they were doing to the people. We start with our local people, and later on we generalize it to all the marginalized areas of Sudan. And that was the objective that were SPLM, SPLA, uh, made an objective in it. What were your key grievances in your area? Uh, definitely there was mistreatment and killings that was happening in, in those areas, in my area and other uh, bordering areas with, uh, with uh, what's so-called Sudan now. But definitely the Khartoum government was the cause because always encourage other uh, tribes and other ethnics uh, against other ethnics. And that was misgovernance uh, that uh, happened in Sudan. Thank you very much. And uh, Honorable Susan, uh, let me welcome you to the program. We are talking about the 37th anniversary of the SPLA, SPLM. And you have some memories, contribution to that liberation. What can you say about why you personally became part and parcel of this struggle? Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you, Madima. Uh, let me take this opportunity to appreciate uh, my presence here today in Fixing South Sudan, and also take this opportunity to salute all the fallen heroes and heroines on this day of the 37th anniversary of the SPLA, SPLM. Uh, I joined SPLA, SPLM in 1984, uh, based on the situation in Sudan by the time, uh, because uh, some of us were born during the war, and we used to hear the stories from our fathers, our mothers, on the situation in Sudan, until we became part of it. So when the SPLA, SPLM, uh, went to the bush, uh, I joined because my husband uh, was going and I have to go. And I'm happy also because as a woman to be part of the liberation of the SPL and SPLM. Mm, thank you very much. And uh, General uh, Marshall Stephen, uh, welcome to the program. What is your story about the trek to build farm, the trek to the liberation? Now you are general, but when you left, it was something else. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Madeline Moore, for having me on the 37th anniversary of uh, the liberation uh, movement and the foundation of the SPLA. Um, the question is clear that what led us uh, to go to the bush and form the armed struggle in the name of SPLM, SPLA. Um, when I left, I left as a student. Uh, I was a student at uh, Juba Commercial. And what was happening in the country, it was a colonization by the Khartoum-based government to the south. There was plans for redrawing the borders. There were plans of including all the uh, productive areas to the north in the map, and that have uh, uh, steered the uh, thoughts of the students. And by then, before we go to the to build farm, we had a clear distance activities within the towns uh, so that we can be trained as soldiers and then face uh, the, the enemy by fighting them as soldiers. But it was not possible to do it inside uh, the country, and that is why we had to leave uh, the country, joining the bush. I personally, I left uh, my town, Pibor, that was on 26 April 1983, and the plan was to go join Anyanya II, who were operating in Ethiopian borders, so that we go and train, then come back for the plan of the SPLA, which was to have 
uh, a popular uprising uh, inside the towns that was supposed to be in July, but uh, the laws have preempted the situation and they attack Bor and Pibor uh, on the 16th May uh, 1983. So the plan was to go get military training, come back and join the revolutionary forces uh, of, uh, of Battalion 105 um, uh, and uh, 106, uh, who were deployed in Bor, Ayod, Pibor, and Poshala. Uh, and there was a plan also to have the same uh, operation starting all over together in July 1983 in all of the thousand towns, towns by then. Uh, but the second plan was uh, to go for a protracted uh, armed struggle if uh, the government have uh, discovered the plan of South. Uh, and that, that is one, uh, that's the one which have worked because uh, the, the government have preempted the situation and then the SPLA have to go to plan B, which is forming uh, and founding the movement uh, in the name of SPLM, SPLA, uh, and that is uh, the motives why I have to go and join uh, the liberation uh, movement it in must, 1993. It must have been a big decision as a student to leave your family and you go to the bush. What really angered you or motivated you to go all the way to Bell Farm? Um, that's a very good question. Um, as I have stated earlier, that there were plans by uh, Khartoum-based government to redraw the borders between the south and the north. That was to include areas of uh, rain, areas of Bentiu, to include it to the north. And that had angered all the students. Um, I remember... At a personal a, level, there yes, was anger. Yes. And I was angry, and we started the clandestine activities of forming revolutionary cells within the, within the schools. I remember my name was, uh, I had a code name, that was My Blood, that was my name. Uh, my colleague called me My Blood because I was ready uh, to sacrifice with my blood. Thank you. Thank you. And let me bring you in here, uh, Dr. Maj Majer, guy. And you were part of that revolution as a Red Army, and what was your story for being part and parcel of the movement? Welcome. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this uh, very wonderful um, event commemorating the 37th anniversary. As you can see, uh, we are growing up now. But when the war started in 1983, I was six years old. I was in Bor when the, the fight happened. Uh, subsequently, I spent one year in the village uh, hiding because my father and others were part of the movement, and so we were targets. In 1984, we went to um, Ethiopia, Itang, where we started getting some education. And then in 1985, 86, uh, we were formed into what is called the Red Army. And from there, we went abroad to study. What I want to say about this is we understood early on the challenges, because we walked 800 kilometers from Bor to Ethiopia. That journey was so perilous, even for us, those who had not seen anything then, we saw during that journey the challenges that we were going to face as a nation. And so when we went abroad to study, a lot of those who were going to fight were our uncles. And they were very happy. Maybe uh, General Pien can remember this. They were very happy, those of Koryom, because they said, we are going to fight, liberate this country, and you, our children, go study and come tomorrow to come and build it. And so the idea for them was that this war was going to be short. They had so much enthusiasm. The morale was so high because they were, they were properly inducted into why we needed to fight the war. So we fought our own war. Uh, I went abroad. I was away for 20 years. During those 20 years, the thought of those people that were happy going to war, to die, to liberate this country, and entrusting us to come back with the knowledge to build it, 
kept me going. And so I became a doctor and I returned to South Sudan. Thank you very much. And uh, General Piang, let's dive into it. Uh, our theme is liberation agenda. And you were talking about people moving individually and then in the end converge and form a movement with the name SPLA. SPLM. Let's talk about some of the strategic objectives. It was already coming out that there was some kind of resentment towards the northern regimes. There was marginalization of South Sudanese, discrimination, injustice, underdevelopment, you name it. So if I ask you, what was the liberation agenda as one of the leading commanders during the War of Liberation? General Piang, what is your answer? Uh, thank you very much, and I want really to say that uh, many people have been saying that uh, there was no SPLM. But definitely any decision that any one of us took to join the liberation was a political decision. And this is why we think that all of us we were politicians. While we were giving priority to the liberation, through the armed struggle. So this uh, part of the liberation, which is the armed struggle, this is what made people to see that there was no political organization in our movement. But in fact, as you have been seeing, now many people may be saying SPLA, SPLM. But if you can observe me and uh, Marshall, we are saying that SPLM, SPLA, because definitely it was SPLM first before it become SPLA. And SPLA is an arm wing of the SPLM. That is very important and to be clear, uh, many people should understand that. This that, is historically speaking. Yes, that is true. So definitely if you have seen even the first structure of the movement, was SPLM political military uh, high, high command. command. It was always because there was component of uh, politicians, like the father of Mike, who is Uncle Udua, and those of uh, Benjamin Ball, they were part of the movement, and they were more senior than even the rest. They were senior to those of Salva, to whoever, and that is very important. The objective definitely, it was defined in our manifesto, and, 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 and that was very important, even if some of us were not agreeing with it sometime, but later on we have been convinced by the fact. Because when people were talking about the new Sudan and liberation of the whole Sudan, for some of us who were having uh, this idea of uh, Jalaba and my Jalaba, we thought that this was too much. Why are we calling for the liberation of Sudan? But the reality was that not all Northern Sudanese are Arab. And we have found that when those of Comrade Yusuf Kua and those of Comrade Abdelaziz from Nuba Mountains and those of Comrade Malik join in, we really convince ourselves, these people, even if when we were in the, the schools, they used to refuse to be called Nuba because they think that they were Arabs. But later on, it appeared that they were calling themselves Nuba and they were calling themselves as Africans and all this. And this really convinced us that there is no reason why we should not also involve them in the liberation. And in fact, and this is why, many people may be saying that we were using this term of New Sudan as something just only as tactical. We just want to get support and whatever and all this. But that is not correct. Frankly speaking, I'm one of the people who was convinced of possibility of forming New Sudan. And what were the key principles of New Sudan? The, the, the key principle was that, you know, all the problem we are talking about, like killing that was happening in northern Bahar Ghazal, in Abiyye, and in other areas in, 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 uh, in Upper Nile, and also the 
policy of uh, taking oil areas and also uh, about the canal uh, and division of, of South Sudan. In fact, like what Marshall was saying, all these were made by a few elites in Khartoum. It was not the whole North that was making all those policies. So this is why we thought that the problem is Khartoum, not, not anywhere in the North is Khartoum. Those who are ruling the Khartoum are the problem. And therefore, we have to change that. And also, they are the one misleading people. Like in Anyanyawan, in fact, Nuba people and Darfurians were the one who fought the war in, 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 in the South. And this is why we identify the real problem during our struggle. And we have, in our political schools, we have been uh, trained and we have been shown that where is the real problem. And this is why in most of Dr. John's speeches, used to say that the problem is not Southern Sudan problem. The problem is Khartoum problem. And that is the most important. So the objective is that we have to change the mindset of the people, whether South Sudanese or even those in the North, because South Sudanese were seeing themselves isolated. And this is why the movement was talking about that you be open, your mind to be open and see it in a wider uh, concept and not in a very narrow concept. And this is why, in fact, we were able to really mobilize the rest of Sudan. You wanted a country where everybody was equal and there is justice and there was uh, equality even in terms of uh, development. That is true. That is true. And that's why we said that let us not take this issue of separation as a principle. The issue of separation is going to be a result of Khartoum refusing what we are saying. We want equality, we want justice, we want uh, uh, what we... Prosperity. Prosperity and also all the people to be one with the same chances. And if that is not happening, this is why Dr. John was saying that it will be up to you, especially <coughs> after signing of the agreement, was saying that it will be up to you to vote to be the second citizen in your own country or vote to be first citizen in your own country. Thank you very much. And uh, Honorable Susan, uh, if I say liberation agenda, is it something that comes up prominently in your mind? Do you think there was a liberation agenda? Uh, there is. There was a liberation agenda. As uh, Comrade uh, Piang narrated in his uh, uh, statement, uh, a lot was happening in, in Sudan, and uh, that prompted the South Sudanese especially to leave the country, to go to the bush, to fight. Uh, the liberation agenda was that we need freedom, uh, a country whereby everybody will be free, where we'll have education, where we'll have the health facilities, where we'll be having roads. And you do whatever you want to do as a citizen of that country. Yeah. Thank you very much. And General uh, Marshall, uh, the SPLA, SPLM do not just fight to correct what was wrong in the Sudan, but also to implement what is right. And so if we say liberation agenda, what is your response to that? Uh, thank you once again. Uh, SPLM, SPLA fought for the liberation of the whole Sudan. And it has been said earlier by General Piang and the Honorable that uh, people were, were not considering this objective as a feasible uh, objective because uh, people in the South were seeing themselves as being marginalized, uh, being oppressed, and they don't have any uh, equal development 
as compared to the north. And therefore, people from the south were thinking that they would go only for the liberation of themselves. That is the south to liberate south from the north. But the objective reality that showed uh, itself on the ground, it is that the uh, oppressive regime in Khartoum was actually oppressing all the masses of Sudan, and especially all the marginalized people of Sudan, those people who are living in the periphery. And the, uh, the Arab, according to what people in the south were perceiving, were anybody living in, in the north. But the SPLM put it clearly, is that the minority clique regime living in Khartoum, these are the people who are calling themselves Arab, and for the agenda of oppressing the rest of the people of Sudan. So SPLM objective was to liberate the whole Sudan and come with the ideas of the new Sudan, where people in the country called Sudan, uh, according to the uh, SPLM perspective, was to live in um, equality, regardless of gender, race, uh, uh, relig religious affiliation, or, or, or region. Uh, so the SPLM was fighting to create a country where everybody uh, find themselves that they belong to that country. Thank you very much. And let me get your brief intervention, uh, Dr. March. What was the liberation agenda as you understood it? Uh, as I said, we were um, the pioneers of the Red Army, and uh, we were uh, clear inducted uh, to understand that the future would be in our hands to make it better for all. All those objectives that the generals and uh, the honorable have been talking about, it was meant for us to prepare ourselves so that we fulfill them. So the agenda for me was very clear. Go study, prepare yourself, get the skills that are needed, come back and help build the country. And the same goes for many of my generation that had a chance uh, to go abroad. And we take that education that we got not as a privilege. It, it is a responsibility. We were the lucky few that managed to go and study. The others that were not lucky to go to study, they joined the movement as they grew older and they fought the war. Others went to resettlement in, uh, in North America, Australia, and uh, even in Europe in some countries. And so for all of us, it, it's always been clear. The marginalization that we are talking about, the injustices that we are talking about, the lack of development that we are talking about, we're going to be um, er eradicated by this generation that was sent to study and prepare themselves. And so when I come back, and, and I see what's going on in the country, I feel it's my duty and it's the duty of all of us, those who were entrusted with this agenda, and that's why I'm separating it. The agenda for those who went to fight was direct liberation. The agenda for the kids, their children, which is us, was to prepare ourselves so that we take the mantle of the country and develop it. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Fixing South Sudan, your ideas for building the new nation. I am Adingor. And with us is our Liberation Agenda panel, composed of the following. General Piang Deng Kual, former IGP South Sudan Police Service. Honorable Susan Wasuk Sokiri, Member of Parliament, TNLA. General Marshal Stephen Babanen, Commander, Northern Area Command, SSPDF General Headquarters. And Honorable Dr. My Martin Majergai, former mayor of Bo Town, and welcome once more. And we take it up from here. If there was a liberation agenda, the talk of everyone was when we have a country, how is it going to be? And of course, there were promises of dividends. And General Pieng, let's talk about liberation dividends. You cannot speak about a revolution that killed thousands, possibly even millions, and you don't speak about the benefits of that kind of a struggle. 
what is the liberation dividend. It is something that has been said by the civilians in the SPLA liberated areas. One day, we are going to enjoy our nation. How can we honor the sacrifices of the men and women in the revolution? Well, thank you again, and I want to say that, you know, there are many people who are very skeptical, skeptical uh, that, uh, you know, liberation agenda have not been implemented or have not been fulfilled. But for me, as a person, I think that it has been fulfilled, uh, even if not to the degree that uh, everyone was expecting. Because, you know, expectation definitely uh, is different from the reality. And if I start with uh, liberation of uh, marginalized people of Sudan, I think it has been uh, fulfilled. And it's good to hear that there was a revolution in Sudan. And I think it was a legacy of SPLM and SPLA. And there is no doubt that without that objective which SPLM put, there could have been no revolution in Sudan. The other thing is liberation. And definitely, uh, I think any South Sudanese cannot today blame us that, what have you done? Because what we have done, we brought independence. And independence, it has uh, definitely a dividend. Now, there is freedom uh, in terms of people deciding what they want to do. And even if maybe they don't get what they are expecting or they were expecting fully. But at least there is something. Like now, definitely, no South Sudanese one time become a Lieutenant General. And Marshall is here. And now the head of the army is South Sudanese. The head of police is South Sudanese. And the president of, of the country is South Sudanese. So definitely, I think that this is also is a dividend. Maybe when we go to the other dividends, like when we were in, in the struggle, we were talking. Dr. John was saying that any surgeon will be a director of a company. And that if you can command a platoon, what can prevent you to, to be responsible for a factory? or for a company or something like that. These were really, uh, at uh, that time, during the struggle, you have to encourage people. Like, I do remember Corium uh, was singing that when the liberation comes, the wife of an SPLA soldier will have Amara, will have uh, Arabia, will have Yorse, will have whatever, and all this. Uh, these are the things that you may talk that they have not fulfilled themselves. But for sure also I see that sometimes it's there. There is this now for our survival, our martyrs survival, the dependents, their wives, their children. They have not got what they are expecting because for sure this is what we have been saying, that you fight. You can fight, and definitely after liberation, everything will be okay. Even if you die, people will take care of your children, they will take care of your wives and all this. These are the things that we have to accept, that we have not yet uh, given. And for sure, I want also to really encourage all our living uh, SPLA soldiers who fought not really to be discouraged. I want to say that let us be proud because definitely when I move on the road now or I go anywhere, I really feel proud. Even if you don't get something now as a person or physical thing, but morally, I am sure that I think we have uh, succeeded and we have given some dividends to our people, even if we still have a long way to go. The Thank unfinished uh, part of the liberation yes. is the unfinished agenda, which is to make life better for all the people 
of the country. Honorable Susan, let me bring you in here and to let you expand on a thought that you had mentioned. Liberation is actually about services. People need to see changes, positive changes in their life. As a woman and as a liberator, what would you like to see done uh, by the government or by the movement that liberated the nation and is still the ruling party. Welcome. Okay, thank you once again. Uh, first of all, I want to say that as a South Sudanese woman, I'm really proud of uh, our women because the role that they played during the liberation, I'm sure if women were not there, men alone they would not be, men alone they would not be able to, to, to do it. But because we are there by the time, we have played a very big role, and I want to really appreciate the women of South Sudan. Uh, we are proud also because uh, all the suffering that we have met on the road to the freedom of this country, we will not regret it because we have our country now and we have our identity. It is very important to have your identity because when we are in the north, we used to study in the schools. You must take the Islamic religion, and it is not your religion. Because if you don't do it, you will fail the exam. We have done it, but now you are free to choose the religion that you, you want. Uh, coming to the question of that, uh, whether we have met uh, uh, or the, the freedom we are talking about or whatever, we, we are thinking at the expectation. Yes, I can say that. We have some. We have not finished, but we are hoping for the best. Now, if we have the total peace, we are going to have all these things in our hand. Still, we have the issue of the security in hand. We don't have good hospitals. We don't have good schools in some areas. If we talk about Juba, yes, you can get good schools in Juba, but when you move to the States, it's still our children are still suffering. And uh, during the war, we have a thinking that immediately after the liberation, everything will be okay, which is not the situation now, but we are still hoping for the good things to come ahead of us. What more do you want to see done to alleviate the suffering for the women who contributed uh, in a very prominent way to the revolution, and what, what, what more would you like to be done? We we, in peace. this program, we speak about fixing South Sudan. What kind of a country would you like to see? Yeah, we cannot fix South Sudan when we don't have the total peace. Let us have the peace. Like now, we form our government three months, and up to now, we don't have the, gov the, the governors in place. So with all these, I don't think we'll be able to, to get what we are talking about or what we are projecting on our head that we want to see as women. We want peace. We want our government to implement the peace so that we can work to the future of these children. Thank you very much, uh, General Marshall. There were many promises during the liberation. In fact, a lot of high expectations about uh, the enjoyment that will follow. Uh, after the liberation, uh, there is a still unfinished business of the liberation to make South Sudan better than it was and that, than it is. So how do we bridge the gap of expectations? Thank you once again, uh, Comrade uh, Medin Mor. Um, this is a, a very, very good question and it is so important for all the people of South Sudan to hear uh, about unfinished task of the liberation and what should we do. By the way, the expectation of the people of South Sudan for their prosperity are very simple. They want to have uh, hospitals, they want to have schools, they want to have roads, and they want to have the opportunity of doing business uh, in their free will. Yes, uh, the liberation have uh, delivered a lot for 
the people of South Sudan. Uh, that's why we are now having a country of our own. We call it South Sudan. Even the right to self-determination, uh, which was given to the people of South Sudan, is one of the big dividends of the liberation that the liberation have achieved. Um, yes, any uh, distance that you need to cover, it start with one step. Um, when we started the agenda of liberation, we have to think about it and put the strategies, then people go practically for training, then they take up arms and they fight and they achieve the objective. This is the same thing that our country uh, is right now, uh, nine years old, um, and we can see some achievements as mentioned earlier by uh, the previous speakers, that we can see some other things that are coming up showing the development in the South, especially when you look uh, to Juba, uh, look at Juba, you will see uh, those uh, dream houses where people were uh, dreaming to have. Although uh, all the development, according to the perception of people in South Sudan, is that it has to be fulfilled by the government alone. But once you have a country, you have uh, the public sector and you have the private sector. Private sector only meet the conducive environment uh, of which uh, it is to some extent hampered by the uh, unnecessary and uh, senseless wars that the country have to wage against itself after the indep independent immediately. But uh, we are moving steadily to, uh, to achieving these objectives. Like now, in the situation of COVID-19, uh, uh, it has confined everybody in their places, in their countries. So one of the important things that we still need to have and want to see is a good hospital where we can treat all our people within the country. These are the expectations and these are the things that we are moving towards them uh, gradually. Some modest progress has been registered, but more needs to be done. And let me bring you in here as a former mayor of Bor, talking about the expectations of the people, the movement for it, and then some structures were put in place. What has been your experience with what the people have been saying or, or what the people want and what actually exists? And thank you once again. Uh, I, I first want to uh, make sure uh, or clarify a point which we all must embrace, which is uh, liberation is hard, but building a nation is even harder. And I say this because I struggle with it every day. Uh, we have a roadmap. In everything we do, there's a roadmap. The roadmap for South Sudan is even in our national anthem. It says, for justice, liberty, and prosperity shall forever reign. What it, what it means is that every one of us especially those in position of decision-making or power, they have to include this in, their, in whatever they do. Whatever you do, you ask yourself, is this bringing more freedom to our people? Is it bringing more justice to our people? Is it bringing more prosperity to our people? Which, the, the way to go about it is to build a strong institutions. Institutions are a major problem in South Sudan. This is something that the parties that are part of this agreement now and are, are part of the coalition government, they have to focus on the institution. A strong institutions will help make sure that we can build the hospitals that the, the general was talking about, that we build schools, that our law enforcement is there so that justice, is, uh, justice prevail. So focusing on those institutions is very important. The other aspect that is also very important is, uh, and in 2018, I visited um, Singapore. While I was in Singapore, one of my friends, who is an Australian, 
asked me a question that I couldn't answer clearly. He said, you see what is happening in Singapore? We have three main groups. We have the Malay, the Indians, and the Chinese. They have lived here for long. They had their own difficulties, but they figured out a way to come together. They, find, they found I, an identity. So forging an identity for South Sudan is a major task that we must work on. So he said, do you know what your identity is? If you cannot identify an identity for South Sudan, what makes you South Sudanese? What unites you as people? If you cannot find this, your work is going to be even more difficult. And this is what I experienced. As a mayor in Bor, there, there were so many expectations. And the first thing that people wanted is simple things. We have the rainy season every year, and every year bore floods. They wanted us to deal with that. Twelve years, we were not able to resolve the issue. I came, I have been in for one year now, and until uh, February when the government was dissolved. They want clean water. They want more schools, even though we have more schools. And this is the other point that, that must be clear. When people say nothing has been done, this is not correct. If you look at the number of schools that have been built since 2005, 2006, until now, we never had that number of schools in, in South Sudan. The same with clinics. The same with, we had, we had only tarmac road here in Juba. Now we have over 200 uh, kilometers of tarmac road and so on. But the expectations are very high, and rightly so. Because and your expectations, fought. your expectations are very underwhelming. They are low, but their expectations are high. Yes, their expectations are high, and they are, right, they are rightly so, because they fought for this, and they are expecting these services to come. The way for us to resolve this is we have to move away from management by crisis. We have been managing this country by crisis, every year by crisis. We need to move away from it into managing a country by a strategic planning. We need to strategically plan what are we going to do next, and stick to it, and help people accountable. Thank so you. accountability starts with every one of us, and it must be done at all levels. Thank you very much, and I want to end on this note, uh, on the solemn memory of our heroes, we must remember them because they were real people, like us who are still alive. And because of them, we are in this building and we are in the Republic of South Sudan. So quite briefly, why should we remember our heroes uh, on this 37th anniversary? They paid the ultimate price, those who passed away, and those who did not, they paid with their youth, they paid with blood, they paid with lost opportunities. They deserve to be recognized because without their efforts, we wouldn't be who we are today. And for us to move forward, we have to know where we come from. And where we come from was built with blood, with determination, with sacrifice, and with a clear vision that this country will be our country as we move forward. Thank you very much. And may I hear from you, uh, Honorable Susan, the memory of the founding fathers who perish in the war of the men and women. You know them. You know many of them. And many of them are not alive. And sometimes it's easy to take things for granted, that we have a country and people forget about where that country came from. Why is it important to continue to honor their sacrifices? Yeah, it is really important to remember them and and uh, talked about them in such uh, occasions because they pay price. And that price what made us to be here today because of them. Uh, what I want to say is that uh, in South Sudan generally, and uh, women in particular, we don't document our uh, events. Uh, for example, we have uh, the late Agergum, she did a lot for Manyanyawan <coughs> uh, up to the SPLA, MSPLA, but you cannot find any document that is done by women to remember all these uh, activities which had happened during the, the liberation time from 55 up to today. Uh, I think this is one of the things we need to, to reflect and really think about it. We must have a document that and show what women did and, and uh, even the girls who had in the liberation that time. It will be very important. 
and uh, uh, because of the because of the price the price they pay that is why we are uh, having this uh, freedom we are in today and uh, we are still continue moving forward thank you very much and general marshal steven the memory of our uh, heroes they talk about the sung heroes and the unsung heroes the spla soldiers who perish in the valleys and mountains of southern sudan then they will never be known and it is important to underscore that it took many efforts for south sudan to be where it is and you have bitter memories or even sorrowful memories about comrades that you lost in the battle as a liberator yourself what do you say about the memory of your colleagues uh, thank you once again um, as you have just said uh, this takes me back to very very bitter memories and uh, very difficult thought on how this comrade have briefly perished uh, in different fields. Um, I could only remember uh, maybe some few situations that I can uh, talk about it. That was uh, in 1985 during the operation on Joko. Um, I remember I was one the one of the uh, operation staff uh, at the headquarters, and the fight and the battle uh, on Jekyll was a very costly battle. I remember there were some officers who were supposed to be deployed to other divisions who were not operating around Jekyll, but they were to to be escorted up to where their uh, battalions are, so they had to remain uh, with the forces who were fighting uh, in Jaco. And for sure, there were about 103 officers who were supposed to go and join their forces, but they all perished in Jaco. Uh, I used to go every morning uh, to ask for more officers to go and command forces. Uh, who have lost their, uh, their, their, their officers during the battles. Uh, these are very, very bitter me memories. And if we don't uh, commemorate them, then we will definitely uh, lose our way. Uh, we have to rem remind ourselves by uh, commemorating this anniversary, it tells us about uh, where we are coming from, and uh, where, do one, where do we want to go? And did we uh, arrive there? And how to uh, go there? It will be through the push by the memories of uh, commemorating um, our best. So it is very, very important uh, to have this anniversary every year, uh, as long as the country called South Sudan exists. Thank you very much. And General Pian, when you were a leading commander, you led forces into battles, they don't always come back. And that is something that is, must have been very, very distorting for you. What do you say on the occasion, the 37th anniversary and in memory of those comrades? Uh, in fact, uh, on this day, like tomorrow, I really uh, want to, memory, to remember my fellow heroes, Dr. John Garang de Mabior. Why can we not remember him? Why can we forget about him? Who can deny that this man called Garang Mabior have not done something to this country, to this nation, have not done something even to Africa. Why did African leaders, most of them, 
almost slow down their flux in their countries for three days. And why not us to remember him? Why not to remember somebody called Carbino Kwanya, whom we are talking about 16 May, who was the one commanding? Why could we not remember him? Why could we not remember Nishigak Nishaluk, who left his school, and who was the first who captured Buma, the only area in South Sudan that had been captured one. The enemy could not enter to Buma till the last liberation. Why can we not remember all those politicians who left Juba here in 1983, and they left all what they were doing, and they joined liberation. One can, why can I not remember those heroes who fought around me? And I remember maybe sometime in a battle, I may see more than 80 to 100 bodies around me fighting. And I want to say that any person and any nation that have no past is not a person, is not a nation. We have to have our past and we have to be proud of the past because the past is the one brought us here. And I'm real surprised even tomorrow there will be no sign. There will be no sign on the street there will be no sign even in our houses. And this is not correct. It's not correct at all. If the government is not doing any celebration, the rest of the people should be celebrating in their own places. Because this one is not the government own thing. It's a nation own. We should be proud of. We should be proud of that day, tomorrow day, it should be a day that we should be proud because that was the day of the birth of the liberation, the start of the liberation. And this one also we will be remembering those who fought the war. And I want to say that whoever that have a bitter experience of the war should not regret. Myself, I'm not regretting. I'm proud and I want every one of us to be proud. Let us not be discouraged. I know there are things that are not going right, but for sure they will correct themselves. And that brings us to the end of our liberation agenda panel with General Piang Deng Kual, former IGP, South Sudan Police Service, Honorable Susan Wasuk Sokiri, Member of Parliament, TNLA, General Marshal Stephen Babanen, Commander, Northern Area Command, SSPDF, and Honorable Dr. Maj Martin Major Guy, former Mayor, Bowtown. Thanks to all of you, and because of our heroes who died for South Sudan, we must fix it. Having total peace in the country is a better reward for them and for their families. Thank you.